Lupa grew up around his grandparents' farm in rural southeastern North Carolina. When sharing about the inspiration behind his work, Pete says, I was, was rewarded with an awareness of the simple things of life, how a change in light can reveal color and form in everyday objects that so often go unnoticed, learning along the way that sometimes we must slow down in order to see. My works create moments that depict wildlife interacting with the human world. Man is changing nature to suit his own needs, often without regard to the creatures that share this world. Nature, when given the chance, finds a way to coexist with man. The Zen masters have a word, satori, which means a moment of clarity or enlightenment. I wish to engage the viewer in a moment of connection between beings of a shared space, to become aware of these moments for what they truly are, gifts from the creator. Welcome, Pete. Now you feel bad about making me carry all them crazy boxes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for be, uh, letting me be here, Lee Carol. Um, and the Diana, Zach, everyone did an uh, excellent job downstairs. It makes my work look better. So this is where I need to be, things like this. So this We're is glad to have honor. you. <laughs> quite an honor. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share said, my name, yeah. Is Pete Lupo and my wife and I, this is my wife in front, Sherry, and we're from North Carolina originally. I'm from the southeastern part of the state, like Lee Carroll said, down in uh, Robinson County, a little town between Lumberton and South Carolina called Fairmont. It was a tobacco town, and uh, Sherry's from Greensboro originally. So um, this, is, uh, this is what's on my logo, my business cards. Um, this is where we live. Uh, this is the shot of the studio, the house is on the other side. Uh, this is the back of the studio. Um, and this little porch out here, we overlook uh, Yakin River, Happy Valley, uh, Patterson School, Grandfather Mountain. Uh, you can see that next shot. A lot of days, if the weather's right, I'll, I'll come out here to work um, because it's such a nice view. This is the view from the back porch. So Grandfather Mountain's back up here. This little opening through here is Patterson School. Uh, Buffalo Cove is this way. Um, Laura Foster from the Tom Dooley. She's buried back over this way in Tom Dooley Road and all that. So this is what uh, the back of the studio looks like. When I first started, I was a teenager. I was like 14, 15, and I wanted to paint or draw. But like a typical teenager, which didn't come out perfect the first time, I'd get disgusted and quit. When I'd compare myself to other people's work, I just I just get disgusted and quit. So at 28, I was at Greensboro, Sherry and I were married, and I went to the city stage, a little street festival where they have arts and crafts, food, music, things like that. And I saw a guy there doing little half-sized decoys about this big, and they were. Not a lot of detail, but they were painted very well. And being a cocky 28-year-old, I made a comment, I think I could do that. <laughs> and someone made a comment, well, try it. You should try it. So we saw some other carvers, and um, I talked to them, found out what type of wood they were using, which was basswood at the time. And <clears throat> I had an old pocket knife my grandfather gave me, an old case pocket knife. As it turned out, it was so worn out, it was almost pointed to a needle shape. And it turned out to be the best carbon tool I ever had because you could get them little nooks and crannies you couldn't. So they told me what kind of wood. I found a piece of wood and I went to the library, which was about a block and a half from where we worked at, and found the only book they had on carving, and it was carving ducks and birds. If it hadn't been that, I'd be turning wood or making bowls or stools or something. So I went home and I'm at the kitchen table. And I'm working on, and every, back at that time, I cut everything out with a little coping saw by hand because they didn't have a vice. And I, eventually, I would go on and cut out decoys with a little coping saw. And this is basswood. This would have been a little harder. It would take me two to three days just to cut out that with that little coping saw. But I kept trying it, and in this little book, and as it turned out years later, I found out it was probably the leading book, the book that most woodcarvers started with. It's called Bruce Burke's Gangbird Carving. So I went through there and did a little project in the back. And I thought, that didn't look too bad. That looks pretty good. Well, I did the second project, and it looked better than the first project. 
And I've been doing it every day since, for 37 years, so I, got, I was hooked. <laughs> so this is the third project in that little book. That's a little half-sized thing going on the wall. You are only the second group of people I've ever seen this. I, I will threaten my wife not to show anybody that piece. But if, if you're not bothered by me handing this out, I don't mind you holding the pieces and you like that. But once I did that certain little project, then I started doing it. So eventually I moved from the, coffee, uh, the kitchen table and I found an old chest of drawers in the basement. Well, I took all the drawers out and mounted me a, a, a vise on top of that. So I worked in that little chest of drawers for years. So eventually I got the liberty to move into a closet. <laughs> yeah. so I'd be in the closet, but then when I'm through at night, then I had to sweep all the chips into the closet, close the chair, put it in there and close the door. The next morning, pull everything out to work. So I created a lot of birds and things like that. So I, overall, I started doing the decoys because that was, that's what the little project was. So the reason I got a little more into it and kept doing it over and over is the company we worked at. We worked at a, a corporate job. And we just had one of the vice presidents there who was just a lazy shopper. So he was a big golfer, and he had a standing order for his wife twice a year for Christmas. He wanted a decoy and a birthday. So days that he would spend or weekends he'd spend too much golfing, then I'd get a third order for a decoy. <laughs> so that kept me supplied with, with work to do and kept paying for the projects and everything. Interesting. So, yeah. so he was encouraging you, and you were being paid, and that's mm -hmm. what started. Mm -hmm. The first little birds. Uh, this is much later in the year, but they were, they were, they were very rough. I mean, that was, was 37 years ago, and he eventually went on to have probably 16 different pieces. And the good thing, bad thing I ever did was buy him a book of ducks of the world. <laughs> because before that, he just let me make whatever I wanted to. Once he got that ducks of the world, uh, he was starting to ask for things I had never seen before. <laughs> so there was a little carving club in Kernersville that they asked me to come and join. Most of it was older, retired people. And we'd meet once a month on a Sunday afternoon for about two hours. Well, they had little projects that you could work on, little songbirds and things like that. And then certain, some guys there would do little decoys. So I sort of gravitated to following them around and learned and, and, and started doing some of the local shows and things like that. And as, a, as my experience went along, I got a little better, a little better. Um, this is a brief thing on how I start. But the, even the songbirds you see later, and you see, if you see them downstairs on the website, they all start the same way. Yes. This is Tupelo. It grows from the swamps. It grows from... Virginia, all the way around the coast to Texas. Um, a lot of the wood up north is a little denser because we have a, a uh, shorter growing season, so it tends to go tight. The wood from Louisiana, longer growing season, very, very lightweight because it is porous. This is basically a quarter of a tree stump. So they will, the stump, it's like a cypress tree grows in the swamps. So as it comes out of the water and starts to taper in, they'll cut it off at the taper because naturally the grain will get tighter. And they will cut it off the water line. Then they take a chainsaw and cut it in quarters, four pieces. So I'll buy two to three at a time like that. These, something like that, that's about $350, or something like that. But it'll last me four years. Um, so the Cajuns started using it because first of all, it grew in the backyard. And secondly, it's so lightweight. And I'm gonna pass these around and let you feel this is two blood. This is how light it is. Oh, yeah. Nice. And the Cajuns, uh, a lot of people, when they started carving, they use cedar or basswood or pine. They have to hollow the bird out to get it to float right. Oh. Well, two blood was so lightweight, but actually, a lot of times they have to add weight to it to get it to float right. <laughs> so, what I buy is this big block. Then the guy that Harvest is Tupelo in Louisiana. He's got his kids and grandkids go out in the swamps. And then when he gets a piece this big, he seals the ends with wax and he paints them. Each color on the end of wood tells him what process of drying it is. And he will usually dry his wood six to eight years before he sells it. So the first thing you do is cut off the end grain to find out if there are any little checks in it. And usually if it's a good piece of Tupelo, as light as those pieces, you won't have any checks in it. Checks. 
What's a check? Uh, it's cracks. Oh, crap. Anytime you have open pores like that, that's why I put the wax on this side so that the moisture will wick from the sides of the wood and it won't split on the side. You've seen firewood when you cut it and it has the cracks in it, that's what a check is. Okay. And then once I cut out the profile, this is going to be a mallard drape. Once I cut out the profile this way, I sketch it down like that. And then I take the bandsaw like and I draw the pattern on top of it. And this is around the head. You always exaggerate, leave more room in the head and the bill because as you're working it, you never know when the position is going to change. Right? See, I add a little extra on the sides like that. And this is just process of cutting it down with bandsaw. So parts of it, because you've already cut the rounded edge, you can't put it back on the bandsaw table, so you have to take the back saw like that and saw off those blocks of the, head, of the edge of the head to remove this wood fast, uh, remove the wood as fast as possible. And here's the trick. Old hatchet, this is what most of the old decor was used to round off the pine, the cedar, and the tupelo. And this is just an old hatchet I brought. I don't know if you can see craftsman on the handle there. It's sears, but it is super sharp. It will actually shave the hair on your arm. It is that sharp. And then you sit down on a chopping block and start rounding off the edges. And this is and this do this do this to get it out of the, the uh, square as fast as possible and make the is make it as round as you can. And then I sit down with with the carving knives. So are um, you are you hacking it or yeah. are shaping it? With hacking. Hatch, hacking. Yeah. That's why. <laughs> yeah. That's why you see my legs and hands back away from it. Yeah. <laughs> because you're sitting it, I mean the block is probably from here to the table in front of you, and you're just chopping away with the grain this way. Just to remove the hard edges, the squared edges around the side of it. <laughs> Thank you. So then I sit down with the knives. A lot of people will try to use regular knives, and I've heard carvers in the last two or three years. I buy all my tupelo from Louisiana because the longer grow seasons, you saw how light it is. A lot of people on the East Coast who harvest tupelo try to kill them dry or the wood is too dense. And these knives, they're, they're all different types of knives, all different styles. This is just a general roughing out knife. That's a little heavier. Then you have one for real tight areas, very narrow like that, to get up under the neck and make tight little turns. And then they have smaller ones to do around the bill and the head, for eyes and things like that. Are These knives are German made out of old. Japanese or where did they come from? They're made out of old straight razors. Oh. A guy in Louisiana <laughs> makes them by hand. He takes old discarded straight razors he finds in that, reshapes them, and then sharpens them back. And you don't put these on a wet stone or anything like that in a room. You put them on a barber straw. And, that's, and you never have to sharpen them, just do that. After you work for a while, um, and then do that. A lot of, if you do any woodworking, you know the end grain is the toughest part. With a tupelo knife, hey Carol, can I put stuff on your floor? You can. <laughs> With a tupelo knife, it'll just slide through the end grain like that. Mm. <coughs> the difference is, most knives have two planes. They come from the hilt come down a certain distance and then taper again. Well, that acts like a wedge, like you put a wedge on a piece of firewood to split it. When you have those two planes, it will pinch two plug. It'll cause it to try to bunch up. That's the number one comment I have from people trying to use two plug for the first time. Well, I can't get it to carve because it crunches. It crushes up. Well, either they have the wrong knife or they got the wrong style two plug. But this, Tupelo knives are all one plane from the hilt all the way to the thing, just like a razor. They're all in one plane like that. So it slides through the wood much easier. So I do the different, different knives and do different parts of the bird. I'm just working on the bill here, just a close up of that. This is what it looks like. This is pretty much what this is. This is different species. This is what it looks like when you basically do the roughing out of the bird. You just have some of the side pockets. These are the side pockets here, the scalpers, thursals here, the uh, primary feathers, tail and head. 
I like Tupelo. When I first started, I was using basswood, but basswood only comes in certain size blocks. To do a bird with a higher head, you'd have to take the head separately and glue it on to the body. I was never comfortable hiding that little glue line. I could never make it look uniform. So once I found Tupelo and those big blocks, you know, you could do birds this high. So that's why I switched to Tupelo. How many birds can you carve out of that big block that you chose? That's another thing, too. I'll jump back real quick, if you don't mind. Oh, it's further back than I thought. You have to check, once, and that's the other part, cutting this off to find where the grain runs. Because it is a quarter of a tree, say this is the center, oh. the rings will start coming this way oh, yeah. around it. You want to do the texturing. When you're, when all the carving you saw earlier, your whole idea is to get to the finished product. What's, how is that going to affect the painting? So by keeping the grain, because they're curved this way, you move the bird like that to get the grain as straight as possible. Because when you start to, all this grain is running this way. Whereas if your grain ran that way, if you just took it and just used the bottom, some of the grain will be here and it'll curve like that. Well, as you're finishing and doing the texture and everything, those little lines will show up. But if they're running vertical, then they'll just blend in with the rest of the feathers and you won't notice them. Get back where I was. This is what it looks like when you've done a little more cut work with the knives and stuff. You've defined the uh, um, back feathers here. These are uh, thurshals. These are scapulars, which is the shoulder feathers. This is the primaries. This is the speculum, which is actually the secondary uh, primary feathers. Primary are usually 10 feathers on the wings and 10 feathers on the secondary. And this is the mallard drake. Because the tail curls are, you can't, get them and, and maintain the strength. I usually do that, those out of a separate piece of wood and add later. And I'll leave it curl like that and still join till the very last. And then after I define it a little bit, then I'll cut that little bit off, then I'll coat it with super glue just to try to add any extra strength to it. But all the primaries, the tail, everything, the head's all out of one piece on that. So when you're, you'll see it in a second. This is wood uh, duck trap right here. <laughs> Feathers, yeah, feathers. So, as you go further along, these birds aren't quite to this stage yet. Um, just like everything man does, he's got to make a competition out of it. When they were doing early decoys for the, the watermen on the East Coast, when they weren't shrimping, crabbing, everything like that, during the winter they would uh, leave people duck hunting. Well, they made their own decoys and things. So then it's got who had a better decoy, mine's better than yours, and it just evolved from that. So from that, there's all these shows that you can go to all over the country on decoy carvings. And so as I'm in the little um, carving club, going along with that, and these guys are doing a little show, so then I got to doing a little show, so I followed that around. So these birds, when you go to the bigger shows, they have to float in a tank of water. It's about five foot by eight foot long and about this deep and about that much water. And the trick is the bird has to float with the same attitude as you carved it. This bird is a relaxed bird. It's head down like that. So like when you relax, your shoulders drop. By the shoulders dropping, it traps more air in the side pockets and in the back and things like that. It'll float higher in the water. A bird up, alert, it tenses up a little bit, it pushes the air out of the side pockets, it'll float lower in the water. And they always have a panel of judges and everything. It doesn't matter how good a paint job, how good a carving job detail, if it floats with the wrong attitude, it's the first one out. <laughs> You'll go to the, uh, and I said earlier about the basswood, and they will hollow them out. If you don't make a real good seal, that's a good thing too about losing two blood, you don't have to do that. And you'll see them in a tank of water, and the little seal will start leaking. <laughs> and they will, the judges will flip it up, try to give it every chance, every chance, and eventually they'll take it out. But you see people all the time, and, and it'll turn over. 
But there's all kinds of little tricks and things they do at these shows. They have, and this is the bad thing about the competition, it's got to the point where it's, they have ornithologists that are counting feathers. Yes. On songbirds. They can tell by songbird, by the bill or the feet, on what age that bird is. If you've got too many roughage in the back tail and things like that, it feels the bird's too old or not healthy, they'll count that against you. They can tell whether you've studied wild birds or pen raised birds. Because like us, a pen raised bird doesn't get a lot of exercise, but get fat. <laughs> so, and they'll look at it and they'll know whether you're really studying birds. Well, I have never seen any of that kind of stuff, you know. <laughs> so we go to shows and there I hear people talking about pen raised birds and I tell pen and tell Sherry, you know, they can tell the difference between pen raised and wild raised. And she said, Well, you look like you've been pen raised your whole life. <laughs> but she, she used to be lean, but she's better. <laughs> so they're so caught up in the detail and everything because these ornithologists are counting the feathers. This is the texturing tools. They use this is a little rotary stone like this, a rotary tool. And I have little dental bits, little dental stones. So you follow the pattern of the bird. Because the head, when it goes into water and comes back, the water drains off the back of the head, so, and it can't preen back there. So it's always rough like that. I've gone so fast with my photographs, I, I wasn't able to catch up. You can see these burn lines and everything. That, I'll show you that in a second. That beak is unreal. That is so realistic. You, you can feel the weight of that. Can't you look at that beak? It's beautiful. This is the thing, too. And they always, if you've got, that nostril. and I, I eventually, and I've, I've been in a lot of regional shows, local shows in Greensboro and in Charlotte and up and down the East Coast. But then when you get to big ones where they you know, put them in the tank of water, um, and I won a few ribbons along the way, you know, and everyone else, I was in a carving club, they always put their ribbons on a wall at home, so that's what I started doing. So, the judges will look at the bill, and there's another shot coming up. So you use the dental stones to do all like this, the texture and like that, and each, this is more texture in the back, but you can see the burning here. So you take these burning pins, this controlled re rheostat, and these little tips are about the thickness of a, of a razor blade when you buy them. But then I take mine and put them on a sharpness stone and make them even finer. So each body position has different burning and stoning techniques mm -hmm. because the side pockets, the breast, the rump, things stay in the water all the time. They're really, uh, really rough. And there's always opening and closing to catch the primary feathers. The side box will open and the wing will fold up and go in like that to keep it dry. So all the texturing under here is very rough. You see I've done a lot of stoning with the tool to make gaps and things like that. So a lot of this stoning goes from the edge all the way back to the base. And then you come in with a burning pan and split those little lines like that. And it just creates, all of this is just an optical illusion. Your eye is trying to go from a high spot to a low spot. So your eye is telling you there's a depth to it. So here's some more burning on the head as I'm coming back. You see the build again. This, this is, they look underneath the build. So this is our burning, we're finishing the head coming around this way. You can buy study bills, study heads, all this kind of Once there's a market for something, someone will prevent something for it. Um, the funny thing is, they've got all these ornithologists who are at each judging tank, or if you've got songbird at each, each uh, table, there's an ornithologist along with three judges. The funny thing is, they're looking at feathers, they're counting tail feathers, make sure you're going to ride them in all like that. But it's just a given practice. If you do this for a living and you sell it, you go to sell a bird or something like that, you've got to put a face on it. You've got to make a human face <clears throat> or it won't sell. Birds don't have that. Birds have to be able to look behind them and above them. But if you did that, it looks sort of goofy looking and nobody would buy it. So <laughs> they will count because your tail doesn't have the right number of feathers, but they let you have a forehead <laughs> and cheeks. It's just, 
<laughs> it, 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 it got crazier and crazier. Aren't so this gonna, is the. Aren't you going to tell the yeah, story? This is after it's completely burned. And this is what I was, I was mentioning earlier. See how rough texture? I did a lot of spits here and things like that. That's okay. They know that's coming. All the primary feathers, the secondary feathers, primary flat feathers, thursals, uh, secondaries, they have to be well preened, same way with the tail feathers. That means they have to lock. One feather locks on the other one like that. If not, they can't fly, can't trap the air coming up and down. So well preened feathers won't really have a lot of splits. So you can put all these kind of splits in there, but if you do a bird and it's in competition, you got all this split up and all that, the judge thinks that's a sick bird. Birds won't have it that way. They'll count that against it. So this is ready, it's sealed, ready to paint. I use like a two-part sealer. It's a sanding sealer and a, and a uh, paint thinner mixed together. And this tupelo being very porous, it, it draws the, the sealer in immediately. I mean, as soon as you put it on there, it just it disappears. You put three coats in it to put paint on it. I use acrylic. And if it's going to flow in a tank of water competition, you put four coats on it. This is my painting outfit. I have a plastic plate, a country crock, plastic tub from my water, and that's the, the uh, acrylic paint. That's, that's basically as far as I can go with it. But painting intimidates the you know, out of me. I'd sit and watch it and study and plan it for a week. And the best advice I ever got, the guy said, Pete, just put the paint on it. Just throw the paint on it. <laughs> then you have to do something with it. So in two days, it will, at a distance of about 100 yards, it'll look like a mountain. But then I'd spend two weeks just tweaking it. And again, it's an optical illusion. You're just adding high spots and low spots. Other texturing things that you do, like the burning on this, this is iridescence, this is secondary feathers. When you're burning, at the same way in the front, you have a little iridescence here and on the head. You burn very tight, very close together. And this is the magical part about it. It's when you're doing this, and you take this little tiny razor blade you've already sharpened, and you have to have music right. You have to have the right classical music or Native American flute music or something. <laughs> when you're up there with chopping it with a hatchet, it don't matter. <laughs> but when you're doing this, if the music's too fast, you'll find yourself burning too fast. <laughs> so you just put it mellow like that, and just sit. and then as you start doing it. There is some sections of this, there's about 150 lines per inch. <laughs> and you just, you just do it, and it catch, you find your breathing as it goes. Because to consciously think, to pick your pen up, move it over less than a hair, and put it back, you'll start, you'll start moving. So just burn it, and just do it. Breathe, and just let it do it. And next thing you know, you've done this, and you go, how did that happen? And it, 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 I mean, it gives you chills because you realize it's not you doing it. You were Something in the else zone. is doing it. You're in the zone. <laughs> but all this, anything you've got your adjustments like that is burned very tight and very shallow. And what happens is that you've got these little tight burn lines that are very close together. So when the light hits it, the light comes back at a sharp angle. So as the light, the, these are very broad because they're, they're heavily stoned and heavily burned very deeply because you want it to come back a little flatter. But when I paint, like around the head and everything, a lot of artists, a lot of wood carvers will use iridescent paint. But I always applied it too, too heavy and it came back ceramic and I didn't like that. So then I learned everything with iridescent, anything like that, is I paint a base color on it and let that base is very lightweight, uh, very light acrylic paint, almost like a watercolor. That paint goes down into the burn lines. And you do that when you get your base on it. Then when you want to put this blue highlight, you take, I don't know if a lot of your painters, you take dry brush, mix your acrylic almost a creamy color, and you put it on your brush, wipe it off, wipe it off with a napkin, and the burn lines are like this. Then you drag it across the top. What happens is you leave a little bit of that yellow in the head or a little bit of blue on top. But as you're looking at it and you walk around it, you can see down past it. So it gives it an illusion of depth. Because, I mean, it's, it's just wood. It's not going to get any softer than that. 
But again, your eye is trying to look from a high color to a medium color to a low color. So it gives, gives the illusion of, of uh, softness. So as I said, I went on and went to competitions and got a little better, got a little better. And these, are, these are much lighter. Um, this is a pair of green wing teals. Both of these birds are carved from the same piece of wood. So when you pick her up, he comes up. <laughs> and then I've carved a water base as, as he's swimming. And on the back side, you can't really see here. You can see when a duck goes by, where their feet kick up, makes little crisscross patterns. I've got that back through there. This is the other side. So I decided to change it up. And again, you know, I told you you put a human feature on it in order for people to connect to it. The drakes, the males, are always the most colorful bird, especially in, in waterfowl. So this time I thought, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hide his color. And I've got both of her wings out showing all her color. Because normally his little crest here will perk up. And it's very brilliant green, along with his wings are similar like that. So what I did with him, kept his head tight, his eyes are bigger round, he's swimming hard, and she's coming after him. Her eyes are a little narrow, you know, almond shaped. She's coming over his back. And there's not a guy in here who has not seen that narrow eye, not heard that whisper coming over his back. So she's pushing up on him like that. She's scolding him, coming after him. See his eyes are being there, and hers is coming after him. So as I'm going on all these competitions, you know, and I think this is, this is working out pretty well. This is a pintail drake, one of my most favorite birds. It's just because of, of, it's so, you know, it's just, there's just a style about it. So we're at the, by this time I've done re regional shows and shows up down the East Coast, and I thought I was good enough to go to the World's Championship. So I had a pintail drake, and it was bad. And we go to the show, and it puts in the tank. Of course, it's the first one comes out. So everyone's telling me, well, go talk to the judges after and find out what you can do to make it better. What can you do to improve your work? So there's three judges in the each tank, and I went to the first judge. I don't know where he was from. Gave him my pintail, and he's holding it, and he's looking at it. I don't like that. That's wrong. That's wrong. I don't know what that's for. I don't know why you get that on this. And then hand it back to me. And Sherry's with me. She said, what did he say? <laughs> he said, this is wrong, and he didn't like that, and didn't like that. So I finally found the second judge much later that day, and I asked him, and he's like, oh, it's the wrong color there, and I don't know if that's wrong, and, and, they, and they never told me what to do with it. They just told me what was wrong with it. So the third judge was Cameron the judge, and I was by in Louisiana. So I asked him, could you critique my bird? So he looked at it, and I'm going to try to do my Cajun accent. He looked at it and he said, what's your name is? I said, Pete. Pete, I'll tell something to you. We had him pintail in the bayou. A very, very graceful. Uh, let me preface that. When I first started, all I had was photographs you could get in the library. So you couldn't tell a lot by photographs. So the photographs I have, there's a little pouch right there, a little cheek pouch like all animals have. So I put cheeks on my bird. I mean cheeks. So I'm showing it to him, and he said, we have these pintails in the bayou. They're very graceful. That thin bill, that long neck, these long back feathers, that long tail, when they fly, they're very graceful. You go with them big cheek. He fly, your head will be up your butt. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going, oh. Sherry going, what'd he say? He said his head will be up your butt. <laughs> and it makes perfect sense. You have to know the subject. You have to know the anatomy. You can't look at pictures. You don't, you know? And I've never forgot that. I've never done a cheeky bird after that. <laughs> but a couple things started happening about this time. I'm going to competitions, and eventually I worked my way up, and I won the first place in the World Championship in my category. But the going thing at that time, because of these, all these judging and everything, it was like, you know that acronym that said KISS, keep it simple, stupid. The thing was, don't do anything complicated. Don't do anything to give the judges to find wrong with it. Keep it tight, keep it simple. And I'm thinking, and there are songbirds the same way. I'm thinking, how can you push this as an art if you keep doing the same thing over and over just to get a ribbon? 
And if Pintail won best in show at the World Championship, next year there'll be 50. Because everyone's taking photographs of that bird. Next year, there's 50 of the same bird. So I got a little disillusioned with it, and, and, and I'm thinking, you know, I really want to do something else with this except put ribbons you know, on the wall. And about that time, I read an article by Granger McCoy, South Carolina artist. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. Back in the 70s and 80s, or late, late eight, mid 80s to uh, late 80s when I was doing it, we were here, Granger was here. Granger's doing things people have never seen before. Birds off of each other wing tips, you know, seven, eight feet high, things like that. No one had ever seen before. I read an interview that Granger McCoy did, and he started talking about that. He said, you can buy all the DVDs, you can take all the classes, you can go to, you know, all the shows. And in five years, your work will be indistinguishable from anyone else's. He said, best thing to do is quit doing the competitions, Find a bird, live bird, dead bird, and carve what you see, and carve what you like. We went home from that show, I took all the ribbons off the ball, threw them in the trash, and have never kept a ribbon since. He said, do what you know, do what you have a passion about. So the next thing that happened after that, I'm sat in the studio, by, that, by this time I moved to the bedroom, I've got a bigger studio. So. And I'm trying to think, what's my voice going to be? What am I going to do? I don't, you know, what is, what do I have a passion for? So our son come running in and said, Pete, Pete, all these baby birds are falling out in the carport, you know? And we had a cat. So I go out there and I have him keep the cat at bay and I'm scooping up baby reds and trying to put them back in the thing and they're just falling out, falling out. Okay. Easier to hide the cat than with round birds. So. I'm sitting in the swing set, and I'm thinking, what am I going to do with these baby birds? And then I kept thinking and kept looking at it. And Sherry had put some um, flower pots up in the um, shelf on the cardboard, which she couldn't reach the top, and so we went in at an angle. Well, the reeds had made a nest in that. And I started thinking about it, and I thought, that, that's, that's really interesting. I like, you know, things that we have, and they will intermingle and, and make, you know, habitat from that. So then I remember growing up on my grandparents' farms, and I thought that was something I remember back then, where it was a slower pace, and and you know you just more aware of things around you. So this is the first piece. This is called One Man's Trash. My granddad on my on my dad's side, they both they were both, <laughs> and my my mother's parents were totally different. Church going. My dad's parents, I don't think I ever remember them wearing shoes except that funeral, and that was their funeral. <laughs> he would get up in the morning and get his cup of coffee, have these old metalware cups, and we'd have Louisiana coffee with chicory in it, and uh, you could tar a highway, it was so strong. But in the afternoon, when he got back from the field, there was something a little stronger in that cup. <laughs> so after he passed away and everything, the old cup just got in there, but then the wrens come along and made a nest out of it. So that's what started, and that's what kept me thinking along that line. So I did, started doing other birds with other cups in different ways. And Sherry and I go of these old flea markets, antique things, the junkier the better, because we just want rusted. We don't need nice stuff. This is a fat little uh, house rim on this little cup, just say it's laid on someone's shelf or something. And I like fat little birds. Fat little birds look more comfortable than anything. And a lot of people, a lot of people, and I tell people when they order a bird, I encourage them to go like this because it's easier for people to live with a relaxed bird than a one flying or totally alert because you keep waiting for it to do something. You know, you're thinking it's moving, but something like this, people, people seem to live a little easier with that. Is that a real cup? No, the cup's, I'm sorry, I said The cup is carved out of wood. And, and base. The leaves are made out of brass, same way here. The nails are carved out of wood. Wow. And I thought when I first started, as I was making my barn wood myself, and then I thought, if I can make barn wood, why can't I make cups and the nails? And also by making my own barn wood, I create, I could uh, control where the knot holes went out. Yeah. And this is homage to the flower pots. This is called a spring mist because we're so caught up on going, going, going. You know, you're always turning around going, 
we didn't have a spring this year. You know, it seemed like spring just come and go. Well, we had it. You just weren't paying attention to it. <laughs> so these are old flower pots. You can see how cracked and chipped they are. And I found two old antique uh, seed packets I bought online to use as a model. So the seed packets are carved from wood along with the trowel and the butterfly. The, the leaves are made out of brass. They're just too thin wow. to carve out of wood. The, the birds, I mean the butterflies, are carved just like the birds. You take the burning pin, after you get carved out and everything like that, you take the burning pin, start up here, and just do one line after another in one direction. And the same way here. And then you come back and do this opposite and just burn thousands of lines over and over. And if you ever look at a butterfly's wing under a magnification, it's just little scales. So what this creates by burning in two different directions are little diamonds. So the same way with the birds, you paint a base color on there, and then you come back and dry brush the highlights on top of it. So it looks like it's suspended. But again, it's an optical illusion makes you think that there's more depth to it than there is. About how thick is the edge on that wing? I'm sorry? About how thick is the edge on that wing? It looks paper thin um, from here. Here's a flower that I'll show you in a little bit. That The wing on the butterfly is thinner than that flower. Uh, Oh you can actually, before you paint it, you can hold it up to light and it's translucent. Wow, okay. Do you, do you have a lot of breakage when you're doing something? Oh, like I got a box. <laughs> <of stuff. laughs> we do, and I was hoping Kathy Reese, I don't know if a lot of you know Kathy Reese, she's an oil painter uh, in Val, uh, Val Cruces, and she also has a place in Raleigh. We did artists in residence, I've been two or three times, and we came in one day to see um, Kathy. We saw her uh, show, and she had her easel up there and had her oil paint out, and she's letting these kids take the palette knife and just put oil paint on it. And Sherry and I were like, <laughs> and Kathy said, it's oil paint. I just add more on top of it. And Sherry said, you know that box of rejects, all them things broken? <laughs> we need to bring that. So we brought that, and I've got all these the heads are too narrow, the eyes are too far back, or whatever. But kids don't know that. So we'd hide that under the table, and when they come around, their parents, you know, I'd bring that box out, and I'd have all these different birds in different stages and everything. And I said, go ahead and take one. And every one to a child would reach for it, and then their mom would say, don't touch that. <laughs> and then they'd pull back. And I'd say, no, it's okay. And we gave away a whole box full of them. And we had one art teacher from Mississippi, and she was there with two daughters, of course, I gave these two daughters little birds. And she came back, she said, well, I teach art. I said, that my kids would like to, you know, can I carry one back? Sure. Gave her one. She came a little back, maybe 10, 15 minutes later. I said, if I take one back, the other 26 is going to be really mad. <laughs> so we got a grocery bag and gave her 26 more little birds. Wow. Yes. Well, can I just ask you quickly that little child, like, there? Did you hand paint that little trowel? That's yeah. made out of brass? The trowel is actually carved out of wood. Oh. And right. these are too small for you to see. I brought them with anyway. These are little dental bits. You can get it at your dentist off little carbide cutters. And on that little, you'll see a better example in a second. <clears throat> I know I'm going to spill that. You put that little carbide bit in this piece, and then you just let it bite in that wood and just do that over and over. Just let it bite, 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 bite. And as you get a section about this big, and what it's doing is actually tearing the fibers up, pulling fibers out of the wood. So when you get a section about this big, you put that sealer on it, uh, that two-part sealer, and it holds that fibers where it's at. So you do the whole thing like that, and then what you're feeling are broken fibers of the wood, but it feels like rust. <laughs> And then you paint it same, same way with the Oscar illusion, just put in different shades of brown, burnt over, uh, burnt ochre, things like that. Mm -hmm. This one, again, is the concept, uh, and this is going back to my grandparents and everything. This is called a bit of color. Because I remember my grandparents and them, you'd buy, they'd buy lard or something like that. Well, after it was used up in the kitchen, old cans, coffee things, things like that, became canisters. And after it got so old or whatever, then they went to the workshed and then old nails or tools or something like that. 
So this is a bit of color. It adds a color, a bit of color to a weathered workspace. So you can't see it, but in the back of this, there's a little bird nest in the back. I was in a gallery in Winston Salem. Uh, it's where Bob, where Bob, where Bob Timberlake first put his pieces in there, and I knew uh, Bob Timberlake's uh, marketing manager, Frank Stoner, and he suggested I go there. Well, I saw this painting on the wall, about this big. There's an old shed with a shelf on it, and there were three coffee cans. This one, a Louisiana coffee can, and I think a Folger or something like that. But this is also Greg McCoy talked about going to art shows and studying composition, watching other artists. And I knew, I thought, this color goes well with my birds. So this is called, it's called Pilot Dog Coffee. And this is Pilot Mountain. I don't know if you've ever been north of Winston-Salem. There's a mountain there called Pilot Knob. And this is made by Bitter Brothers out of uh, Richmond, Virginia. So I told him, I really like that color. That would go well with my, with my birds and my leaves and my barn with it. He said, well, he, he let me use his can, my can, as a model. So he let me borrow the can. Of course, his is in pristine condition. So I kept it for a couple of months. And it took about three months to do this. It takes about a two weeks just to hollow it out to get it that shape. First thing you do is carve the outside of it. If you ever sell a, a coffee can or any kind of can, when you bend it, it becomes oval shaped in the front. So I practiced doing that until I got that. Once I did that, then I spent the rest of the time hollowing it out. So there's only so far as you're hollowing it, you can feel it with your fingers. After that, you listen to it. When you hear that tone get very high, that means you get ready to punch through it so you back off of it. So but then the inside is, is painted uh, with the uh, rust and everything else. It's so, a really good paint job. You did end up becoming a good painter. Uh, I probably looked at that three weeks before I started painting that. <laughs> um, we go to, and this is the thing we just discovered along the way. When you buy these old uh, ladles and old things like that, you can tell who used them. The chips on this side, it tells you it's a right-handed person. If the chips are on the other side, it's because as they take it off, they be on the edge of the sink. So this one, as I was painting it, a gentleman came over to the studio and saw that and he ordered that one. That's one of my favorite pieces. Yeah. And I think it's downstairs. It is. This is the piece that Lee Carroll snacked and ran with. <laughs> All I had was just the, the base and, the, and the, um, the gloves on it. And she hadn't seen the rest of it. This is called the garden gloves. And this is about my grandparents. The same woman that could pick cotton and pick tobacco by hand could go in there at night and do lace needlework, uh, lace work for a daughter's dress or make biscuits, you know, so soft. And I kept thinking, and I bought an old pair of gloves from, this, from Lowe's and I filled it with rocks, I put them in a box of rocks, and every day for two or three months I just shake that box just to get them wore down. And I thought, how would a woman take her gloves off? A man would just... So I practiced on how a woman would take them off, fold them, and lay them down, lay them down. So that's the first thing I did to make gloves. But because they're so human-shaped, it, it gives you the chills holding them as you're working on them. It's like, but the gloves, the gloves are textured and burned similar to the butterflies and everything else with a crosshatch pattern. Because if you look at gloves under magnification, you'll see a little twist in a thread. By burning them, you, you make a little thread, by burning them in a certain direction, you get that little twist effect. Um, I've got an old egg basket I keep. We bought it one of the flea markets. I use that as a model. These uh, flower petals are actually made out of metal. At that time, I was making my flowers out of metal. And these are three meadow fritillaries. And from studying art and looking at composition, this is based on a 2,000-year-old form of Japanese flower arrangement called Ikbana. And it has to do with heaven, man, and earth. And it creates a circular pattern so your eye comes back to the center of the piece. And you go to shows and you'll see people, which is common for birds, and they, I mean, they do very good birds. But they'll have it on the base, on a bird on a branch. And the birds here and the branch continue past the bird. And you'll see the viewers look at the piece, and unconsciously, that branch leads them away from the work. It, it steers the viewer away from it. So by creating a circle pattern, you come back to it. 
When I first did the basket, carved out the shape, the outside like I always do, I drew all these lines in. Just went around. And then I couldn't tell what was up and what was down. I couldn't figure out what to do. So I went back, just drew one line around the center and the staves. And once I carved the center line, it told me what each line next to it would be. Are those individual flowers that you... Yeah. Okay. yeah. At the time, because I, I, I used to try to do the leaves and feathers out of wood, they're so brittle. Even if you cut them with super glue, they're so brittle that once you touch them, they just snap. So I felt it was easier to do them out of metal. But anytime you put a little crease in metal, it stays. And if you try to do it off the way, it'll crank. And then you get a line in it. So there's only so much limitation, I mean, so much you can do with a metal one. The stamen part are, are all out of wood. You can look at that one if you want to pass that around. And again, this is called garden glue. And I think it's downstairs. This one, we go to the coast a lot. We go to the Bear Islands coast. And these flowers, the one that Eliza has, are called Indian blankets. They grow wild on the Bear Islands. Now you go to the islands, they have a lot of hybrid things called Arizona sunflower. Um, what's the other one? Um, Gallardia, they're called. Yeah, it's, and things like that. So I saw these flowers growing wild on the beach. And I went down to it, always carry a little camera and always carry a little tape measure. So I measured them, counted the petals, took photographs of it, and I kept that for about five years trying to think what I was going to do with it. And then one day we found an old coffee pot that I thought those colors would look good with the combination of the stems, and I thought the only thing that could go with it was a hummingbird. So all that color usually brought all that together. So everything for me, starts with a color or a shape. That tells me what to do with the rest of it. So all these petals that she's got going around, each petal is carved one at a time. The stamen part on top and the one on the bottom are all separately. So I glue those together with a stem in it, and then I take a plastic tub full of petals. And there's only so many that you can put in. There's anywhere between 13 to 15, 16 petals for a flower. So you just keep adding them, and then if you want, if it won't quite fit, you just keep changing petals until you have one that fits, until you put two rows on it like that. So those are wooden petals? Mm -hmm. The coffee can um, is carved out of wood, but it's done separately. The spout is a separate piece, the handle is separate, and the cap is separate. It feels so metal. <laughs> you do? To make that metal like on the cans and things? <laughs> Instead of sanding it, and it's what the Native Americans used to do, they would take a piece of stone or bone or something, and you just scrape it down the side of it. It's called, actually it's called stoning. And it's what they would do with their arrows and, and, and um, spears and stuff. And by doing that, you compress the wood grain. So it comes out with a flat look. And it, I mean, you almost get, and if you do a small one like that, or that little cup, when you tap on it, it sounds like it's made out of metal. But you just go over and over until you get the wood fibers compressed on it. So, is a hummingbird attached by the corner of the tail and the tip of the wing? There's a one flower petal has a metal piece okay. that's coming into the understatement, comes out, and then turns up. And that metal piece is actually carved like a feather. It fits into the slot mm. right there into the hummingbird. Wow. So you can take him off, and then, and then uh, the flowers there with one tail feather made them. So I wanted to do the hummingbird as you walk around it on this particular piece. I think this is in Wilmington, right? As you walk around it, it goes from its orangish red to the, and then as you go around it, you can't see in this photograph, it gets almost a blood red, almost a blue on this side. So it's meant as you walk around it. This is called Coffee with a Friend. Mm -hmm. This piece, the lady that told me that Lee Carroll would come back, she commissioned this. And she's an artist, Kathy McCoy in Caldwell County. She had saw little, little cans I done. As I told you, my grandparents on my, on my dad's side did snuff. Well, they used to use peach brand snuff. 
Again, I saw this little snuff can. It's on my website, and I like the colors of the can. That told me what to put with it, and I put uh, daisies and black-eyed Susans with it. So along with the snuff can, I had an old rusty can. You know, it's about the same size that big. And I had a Campbell's tomato soup can, and all these trio were called uh, Country Warhol. And it goes about talks about um, country people knew the value of, of a little can you know, long before Andy ever did. But they put pencils in and change for school lunches and stuff. Well, Kathy saw that little rusty can, and that's she said, I just want a rusty can. I don't care what you put on it, just a rusty can. And she wanted to sit on the desk at work. So I knew it had to be a little larger. So I started cutting that out, and I was thinking, okay, what am I going to do with it? What, what, what does it tell me have to go there with it? So I had all the holes cut out, and I'm grinding everything, and I know how I'm going to do the rust. I've done that a lot of times. You take that little carbide bit, lead box. So, like Bob Ross, sometimes you can't really control it. You end up with happy little accidents where it just punches through and says, okay, that, that'll mean something. So then I got to think about it, and I said, okay, this is what we see in the natural world now. Everything man has comes from the earth. Everything man has goes back to the earth. So, as you see, it's disintegrating. It's starting to go away. So, I wanted the daisies to protrude <coughs> from man's mistake. And that's why it's coming up through the holes. And the goldfinch is on top in a dominant position. So, she's conquering. This is called fragile world. So, that brought these three elements together, and I didn't really know what to do well, you know, with it, so I started adding little things to it, you know, but it didn't really tell me the end of the story. So, after I got the inside, I thought, well, that's just sort of blank. I got an opening with nothing there. So, then again, the color, I thought, that little chip up brings the colors of the leaves, the, the, the um, acres. I, I know everywhere else in North Carolina, but acorns, but in Robson County, that's an acre. <laughs> so yeah. that, that brought the chipmunk into position that way. And I said, okay, he's got to have something else to signify what he's doing. It. He's living there. All the hickory nuts are carved out of wood, and you can't see it now. But if you look very close, you can see the little incisor marks from the chipmunk mm -hmm. where he's chewed through the, through the hickory nuts. And I've got them all scattered in there. So I thought, there's something else. It needs something else. So I'll go back to this one again. There's a little hole right here. Oh, and I'm adding little things. I'm adding hip nuts. I've got little, you'll see it on the next. There's a little hole right there. Like bugs. You'll see little lady bugs. I've got hidden yeah. around oh, different things. There's this, there's this story that goes, all artists need a dragon lady to tell them when they've gone too far. I had butterflies, I had all kinds of stuff. Sherry's going, we've got to leave, we've got stuff to do, we can't, we can't wait on this. So, that little hole you saw in the back, you see this little chipmunk here, you see that sleepy little eye. On the back side, when you look through that little hole, and Diana did such a perfect job downstairs. She's got a spotlight coming in through that hole up there, right on his face. When you look through that little hole up in there, you'll see his eye open wide, looking back at you, because he knows you're peeping in there. Wow. This piece, and the, I think it was um, the English watercolorist, um, leading critic back in the Victorian era, John Ruskin, said, the greatest reward for a person's toil is not what you receive for it, but what you become by it. So this has started changing me from that cocky little 28-year-old. And I'm starting to breathe, and I'm starting to look at shapes and things. So I'm working on a piece, and I'm working sitting at the studio, and I'm trying to come up with an idea, and I'm forcing it, and it's taking about a week, and I'm, I can't draw the flip. And so basically my drawing is, that's a bird, and that's his head. That tells me what directions he's pointed. So and I'm trying to come up with an idea. I can't get anything. The windows are open. So out of the corner of my eye, I see all these little birds flitting around in trees. I just assume they're chickadees, and I don't pay any more attention to them. So every day, they keep getting a little closer and a little closer, and I thought, okay, and I'm still pushing, pushing, and I'm frustrated. I can't get anything to do it. 
So finally, the one day, they're so close, I put on my glass and the binocular, and I said, oh, Golden Crown Kings. I hadn't seen one of those in 20 years. And usually in the summer, they're at the very top of the conifer trees after insects, but when it starts to cool off, they'll come down lower. So even though I see it as a Golden Crown King, it still doesn't hit me. So I'm pushing this, pushing this bad thing. And it's finally, one day, one of them flies into the screen. And I thought, oh, that, that, this means something. <laughs> I stopped, I thought a gold ground kinglet. I did a gold ground kinglet, and then I'm thinking what colors match with it. This is our neighbor at the bottom of our hill. With it. There's, his parents had a store back in the 40s and 50s. This is a copy of their door off that store. Mm -hmm. So I thought this will fit the bird, that'll fit that, and, and this is all it is. And I've got more comments on this than any other thing I've done. People just look at it and they just say, it's, it's, there's a simplicity about it that just, you know, it just attracts them to it. And there's a Chinese proverb that goes, you cannot call the cat to you, but if you reside in stillness, it will come and that's when you're at. That's true. And this is called doorways. So every time when you're frustrated, a door will open up. Mm -hmm. This is a piece I have on the table. This is, I'll end with this one. If we have any questions. This was about 20, no, 18 years ago. Walking through the woods, I found a broken robin's egg, and it was on the oak leaves. I just like the color. Something about the color I like. And I took photographs of it, kept the robin's egg probably for five, six years, till eventually I held it so long it just disintegrated. Mm -hmm. But I had the photographs and I had the memory of it. And I'm sitting there one day in the studio, remember the basket and the other photograph? And I'm looking at the basket, and I'm thinking how the end of that basket looks like the end of egg. And then I'm thinking that the lobes on the oak leaves look like the end of that egg. So that put the egg and the leaves together, and the basket. And I'm thinking, why is the basket here? What purpose is the basket in the middle of the wood? So, and I, I don't, all I'm after is color. And then as I'm working along, this took about three months. As I'm working along, it starts telling me what the story is going to be. Mm -hmm. So that first basket, I told you I did it one trip after I made the first one. Well, I started in the middle of that basket and went out. But started on the inside of the basket and coming back. Anybody's ever done any basket weaving? As the stage get closer here, you start going one over, two under, one over, two under. And it changes until you get about this far out. There's one over, one under. I made four of these before I could get one. I don't know where the other was at, but this is different sections. In, and I could never get past that. And because you're carving it on both sides, when this one goes down, you better make sure it comes up on that side. If not, it'll punch through. So that, that didn't help it either. So, as I'm going along and I put the basket there, and I know there's something going to go up there, a butterfly or something, and then it starts occurring to me. Of course, I carved the old tree stump. And one day, I just sit there thinking about it. Everything man has comes from the earth. Everything man has goes back to the earth. We are the earth. So the core of the tree is still intact. The core of the basket is still intact. So nature's core and man's core are still intact, and they're still connected. But the man, further man removes himself away from the natural world, he starts to unravel. Mm -hmm. So if you see the staves are like hands reaching out from man's core to come back to your true essence. And then from, from destruction comes creation. And you see the turkey uh, mushrooms on the back. So it brings the question of what happened to the robin's egg. Was it taken by a predator or was it naturally shed from the nest? And it also brings the question, that's what made me put the wren up there, is what is the wren song about? Is it about life or death? Mm -hmm. Beautiful. 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 I this is called Delicate Balance. Yeah. I'm feeling a Native American thing out of that piece, <laughs> but then I would be projecting it on Jones or everything. But um, the basket and that you mentioned several times throughout your lecture, Native American influences. You mentioned the creator, and, mm -hmm. and that's that's a key. Yeah, 
the midterm, and I, I was going to ask you uh, personally whether you had any native in you or does he? You think? Or did I don't you, know. Did I don't you know. End from, up, did um, you end up in this relationship? Because you've been in the woods so much and it's beautiful. Uh, how you've taken in the whole of that experience is very spiritual. And I was curious whether all of a sudden something evolved in you I think from it's, that experience. We're from Robson County. It's a heavy uh, Native American oh. influence, one of the Indians. But that is a question oh, of whether they're really sure. Native American or not. You know, they could be uh, slaves, free slaves, with indentured servants out of uh, from the English colonies and things like that. So you don't really know. And my family came from immigrated from Italy to New York and then worked their way down to the East Coast, Virginia. And there are a lot of Native American tribes up there. Yeah. But I won't claim it because I can't prove it. Because they don't have roles for that, roles been shut, and I can't really say it. But I think the biggest part of it, the influence, is growing up on my grandparents' farms. Mm -hmm. Because after work, we went to the woods, and you stayed outside, and you just started seeing things like this. And I think it's in, in my bio is that it's about moments. Things like this, that in a can and a coffee pot, that you see every day and, and fail to notice until something happens. A bird will land on it, or a butterfly will land on it. And like this, all I wanted was the egg, and I had no idea what it was. But the deeper you get into a moment, it'll take you further into I, it. I, and you'll that's keep going why into I'm it. saying I think you're, you have this far of the spiritual. It's touch it's over it's you because things are coming to you, the birds are coming to you, you're in the zone. It's, it's beautiful. It's, it's being beautiful. in that zone and just being aware of things. Sure. When you see things, you know, but then and the more you come. go into it. Yeah. Well, a lot of, a lot, if you project an image on it before you start, that's what it's going to come out as. So better just to go with a form and a shape and let it tell you what it's going to be. That's nice. Very nice. Yeah. For you. Ducks, um, did you ever do dissections? Like, did you do study skeletons? I'm sorry, I, I Did you ever do dissections with no. SU? No. You talked about how to get to know the birds differently. No, no, no. I've had um, a friend that's a taxidermist, but you can't really use that. I mean, a taxidermist skin, you know, a mountain bird, they can stretch up to 25%. So you can't really go by that. But it's just looking at it. I mean, when I started, there was no internet. Now you can go on the internet and say, Carolina Red, mouth open, sing it. Thousands of photographs. You know, I mean, it's, it's endless, but, but no, just watching birds, things like that. Even these wrens, you'll see on this one, it's got that little human brow on it, that little expression. Wrens don't have that. They have to be able to look behind them. An example is that snipe and woodcock. I don't know, are you familiar with that? They're, they dig in the ground. They're the size of a quail. They dig in the ground in the leaves and stuff for worms and things. Over at evolution, their eyes are rotated more towards the back of the head because their heads are in the ground, so they've got to be able to look for predators, owls, hawks. But you can't corner one like that because people think, well, yeah, there's something wrong with it. So see, you've got to put that human face to it. So is it intriguing to you to do different species of birds? Yeah. And you like these little birds more yeah. these days? I, and you get hooked on those rings because they habitat everything we have to leave around. Shoes, canoes, That's things the like truth. That. And there, you, keep, you try to get your birdhouses out and you say, Bluebird, you're, you're coming here. <laughs> little Carolina wren, you can have that one. But no, the Carolina wren comes and they're all over the place. They take over everything. But then they only lay their eggs in one. So Our neighbors, Bird and Julie, so they're, they're putting up much. birdhouses now and they got bluebird wren. And I'm all for making. <laughs> Make them sign those birds and the <laughs> birds, they don't do it. So is there anything on that that's not wood? The leaves. These leaves are carved in a base. The leaves again, and I, uh, oh, you can come out and feel these. Um, they're just made out of brass. Uh, they come in big sheets, like thick as like a construction paper, and then I cut them out and then paint them. A lot of times you put little holes in them, I just drill holes in them, things like that. I used to try to do them out of wood, and you try to carve, like the, the robin's eggs are carved out of wood. You can carve that round shape. But a leaf, you can try to carve it curved. But once you get away from that straight grain, it gets very weak. And even if you carve it straight and then steam it, it's still very weak because 
the first time you tell someone it's made out of wood, that's what we're doing. <coughs> yeah. we're right. So just for stability, it's, it's better to make them out of metal. Tell them what the ducks are, the two ducks. I'm sorry? Tell them that the two ducks are going to be. Oh, this lady in, good thing and bad thing about art is commissions. It's a good source, steady source, but you're locked into it. This lady in, and I don't understand why. I've got a lot of songbirds on my website. And we go to this, the wildlife art festivals. I've never sold a decoy or a duck at a wildlife art festival. I sell songbirds. The last two years, I've sold six decoys over the internet. People have never seen them before. They've never touched them before. And I'm not sure why. I, I, a lot of people I ask, say, well, it's a given. They know a decoy or something like that. But I get a call from a lady in Southern California, and she wants these two, she wants a family of wood ducks, wood duck right the hen, and then she wants all these babies. <laughs> and I'm telling her, that can't naturally happen. That won't happen. Because the male will stay with the hen until she's in the nest brooding and things like that. And then after that, he goes with the other bachelor groups and they molt. They go shed feathers like that. So for him to be back, that doesn't naturally happen. She said, that's okay. I said, eventually, if you keep this in your house, someone's going to come up and make that comment. That's not going to happen. How can you live with that? Can you live with that? Oh, I can live with that. Okay. So... On a, on a, she wants it something like a riverbank or a little estuary, a little corner, quiet corner. So I've got the drake and a hen like this on a little curve. It's almost like a big kidney bean shape. And on top of that, I'll have that hard water like you saw earlier. The drake will be up front. She wanted the drake head up like he's on guard, guarding the hen. Her head's down like that. She's turning back looking at the babies following her. And I've got like 12 babies all over this way. She also wants two little stumps coming out of the water and all these wild grasses you see in the pond. And on the one of the stumps, I got one baby sliding into the water and the other one, the baby's jumping off in midair. Oh, <laughs> Do you ever so, sign? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, go ahead. Do you ever sign your work? Yeah. Is that yeah. bottom? Yeah. Usually on the decoys on the bottom. This one, because I didn't want to, I just had it painted on the side. But on the like the coffee cans and things like that, I'll sign them on the bottom of the cans. It'll be actually carved into wood. What do you put your initials in the year? I usually just put my whole name, P. Lupo. P. Lupo. Two four letter yeah. words, you know, like. You know, put the year. Yeah. Year. Some people, oh, the, the more you read about art, the worse it is. Sometimes it's good, sometimes bad. And there's this big controversy, don't date your work. You know, date your work, don't date your work. I like it. I, I always put it in there. Um, I've got one gentleman that some of the photographs, the, the, uh, the pile of coffee can, um, he started buying decoys, now he's buying it. He's probably got a dozen of my pieces. So he likes the progression through the years to, to be able to see that. Yes, so with that basket, did you do pieces and weave them, or you no, wove a basket, destroyed it, and then carved it? This carved from this carved from the single piece of wood. That's crazy. Uh, <laughs> it's crazy. You can do this. It's amazing. I grew up on that tobacco farm. I grew up outside, grew up in the woods, and I always thought one day I'm gonna get that job where I can wear a tie, where I can dress up and not be cold, not be dirty, not be sweaty. And I finally worked my way up through trucks and cars and all that into where I got a job, a corporate job at Volvo Truck Corporation, the world headquarters. That lasted one year. And I thought, I got to get the hell out of here. Yeah. So that's the cool thing. And people say, well, how long have you been doing this? 37 years. But the reason I was able to fast track it is that Sherry and I were married about a year. We both worked at the same company. And all of a sudden, Sherry came home one day and she said, I got this job opportunity, but I have to go to Iowa and train for like six to eight months. Ooh. We had a daughter who was 13, the son was, I mean, daughter was thir eight, the son was 13. She said, if you can take care of the kids, school, homework, that, take care of the house and all that stuff, when I come back, do you want a car full time? Well, I've been doing it about five years. Well, that five years, you're always thinking, as soon as, you know, all I, I can make a living out of this, I can do this for a living. And then when it's presented to you, you're like, oh, you know. 
And I'm, I'm coming up with excuses not to do it. But we can't lose my money. And how are we going to lose my salary? She went back and asked for more money, and the darn fool people gave it to her. <laughs> so then I'm committed. So if she went away, and we did the year, and everything worked back, everything went on, and it's been that way for 35 years now. <laughs> she'll tell people, she'll tell people when we first started that I couldn't turn the washing machine on, I couldn't figure out how to do any of this stuff. After about a year, I could go in there and tell someone to move my dials. Yeah. Who's been in the laundry? <laughs> And we live in a little cabin. You saw a little cabin. And she was in the kitchen the other day, and we bumped into each other. She said, this kitchen is so small. I said, it's small because you're standing in it. You're going to be in there. You don't be in the kitchen. This is my job. But it works for us. She travels globally for a job, and I stay home. Wow. Yeah, the question on the difference between when you're making this piece, which you started with the egg, you had it five away years ago, and then basket and find the rain came about. That kind of evolves from the color first, as you said, and the store to put these together. But then you've got a commission and they want that. How do, what's the approach then when you've got Is their vision? How, how do you that's what's the question. recipe for that? Here. Versus the, color, memories. Is to try to put my spin on it and try to put him being guardian, him being, you know, proud and like that, but I want her attention on the babies and doing stuff with the babies to get them look different action. And, and the piece is <clears throat> to have a quiet scene, almost a track and water things like that. Um, big difference. That's the thing about commissions. I, I would rather do this, but something, I mean, that's, that's close to $18,000. You know, and I didn't, you know, that's selling out and all that, but um, it's good money, and I just can't turn I think you put your process, your free spirit, that wonderful thing where things just happen magically, I think you put that in the commission. I think you don't let go of that. I think you still work with that. There's things you can do with because individual Because otherwise birds. you would be so restricted, I would imagine that you would go, oh. There's things you can do with individual birds and things like that. And it's true that he would not be there with her, you know. But I've got little babies, and they're all wondering about the one to slide in the water. These two are looking at him. And as you look at the piece from where Liza's sitting at, everything is moving in front of you. Everything's swimming away, everything, except this back baby. It knows you're looking at it, it turned, and it's quacking at you. <laughs> so just to put a connection between people and the, and the piece. I'm wondering if, as you're carving, whether they take off, they take characters on in your mind, and then and within that they come more alive. I know that kind of happens to me when I paint. I start to know who that is that's on yeah. my canvas. Yeah. And I'm wondering because they've done psychological studies where they just t say if you watch shapes for long enough, and they will start to take on. People will give them a, a character. They will yeah. not all be the. Yeah. same anymore because our brains just do that and I think maybe while you're sitting there are you often just kind of musing about say the ducklings and you know which is the body yeah. one and so forth yeah. I mean even though even though when ducklings are following him they're all grouped together they're going to be so tight together they're all a mass but I decided to make each one a personality right. so as you look at what each one's telling a story same way with her I mean I mean make her you know a little little of course this is not even with really a close finish, but a little more up uh, like she's proud of what she's doing. Um, there is some something that you lose in it, but with something like that, you have to put your own kind of spin in it. But with, with those ducklings, I guess to keep asking the question, with the ducklings, do you think this is going to be the one that's slow and this is going to be the one that's sort of, you know, yeah. naughty? And, or does do you carve and you see this character coming along and you're like oh that guy's you know yeah this I, I draw out a pattern for him and as I'm placing them behind her I'm thinking okay the two in front are closer to the drape they're more up they're like more you know oh I'm gonna follow daddy and as it goes around then they sort of change personalities as it come back so as I'm doing it and I wanted to make my one piece of wood but it was just too hard to get the details so I ended up having to split them so as I'm doing them now and I'm working on it. And even your best intention is to keep it in one 
attitude. But as you go along, the attitude changes. Okay, instead of number four, it's now moving to number eight. You know, to, that attitude will work back, better back here than up front. We, we need to. Okay. <laughs> um, but thank you very much. And, and thank there's you. more next Tuesday. So um, come for coffee with the curator, and there you get coffee. Yeah. <laughs> and, donuts. and if everybody would leave your address, he is going to sometime get a newsletter. So if you leave your address, he's going to do a newsletter eventually. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. 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 Thank you.